Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Stefan Swanepoel with Jack Dean Cottrell today. The team, the three of the people that are going to talk about the Swanepoel Trends Report. It's yet again that time of the year. Uh, for me, it's sometimes the most painful part of the year because it's so tiring because we really spend, oh, I always put the number down at about a thousand hours, but I think I'm under exaggerating. I think the number is over that. But there are many people in the T3 organization, uh, the two which I'm going to introduce to you momentarily as well, and of course, a bunch of other people. Kelly White, our new chief operating officer, Paul Haggy, who of course is our, our chief editor and our executive editor, and then a bunch of our other consultants like, like Travis and Michelle, and then there's Jonathan, and then there's Mark, and oh my goodness, there are so many on the team these days that I can tell you that the work and the effort, the love and the passion and the commitment that is put into bringing you the annual Swanable Trends Report is, um, it's, it's extensive. I'm, I'm not sure it's worth the effort always, but it is something which I don't think we can ever stop. The commitment and the love for the product is so much. So before I, I hand over to Jack, because Jack and Dean are actually gonna handle this session today, I'm gonna be with you just for a couple of minutes. Uh, we have, a, there's three or four other trends talks today. It seems like it's a popular topic and I'll be popping in in some of the others as well. So um, I'm handing you over to two of my trusted allies in the company here. Uh, but I thought I'd just make an opening statement because I'm the only one that so far has been involved with all 16 of the trends reports. And it's been quite a journey. In some cases, one would think that we've been covering the same topics. And in some regards, we are. Brokers are still important. Profitability is still important. Technology is still important. Associations and MLSs are still important. Mergers and acquisitions are still important. So in some cases, we're covering the same topics. But on the other side, almost everything within those topics have actually changed. And everything is morphing and growing and adapting. And I know that many people love to reference Oh, well, Blockbuster isn't here anymore, and Borders didn't make it. Look what happened to Kodak, and you know, JCPenney is also heading that way. But those are brands. Those aren't trends. Those are companies that are specifically no longer with us because they did not adapt. We want you to adapt. Entertainment didn't change. It didn't go away. Maybe it changed from Blockbuster to Netflix, but it didn't go away. Travel changed, didn't go away. It's a little bit less during COVID at the moment. Even Thanksgiving changed this year, but it didn't go away. So why on earth would you think that real estate brokerage is gonna go away? It isn't gonna go away. It is going to change, it is going to adapt. It has been doing that for the last, what, 100 years? Most certainly since the first time I, I got into real estate in 1983, which is now what, 37, 38 years ago. It's always been changing. It is certainly changing a little faster these days. And it has, I would almost like to say, if I may, Jack might say, this is not the right word I should do say, but I think real estate has graduated from high school now. <laughs> We've grown up, yay, right? It's taken us a long time, but we have become, I don't like the word corporatized, but whether you wanna say we have been taken over by corporate America, we have become corporate America ourselves, we've become public, we've become commoditized. Some of those words are negative, some are positive, some mean different things to different people. But we most certainly have matured as an industry and we have largely in the last dozen or so years graduated from a predominantly mom and pop cottage industry to a very much more corporately influenced, corporately run, capitally infused, technology driven space. Of course, not everybody's going to go that space and neither do I imply that that space is necessarily the only solution. But we have many more public companies today than we've ever had. Public company is not the only solution to real estate. You can be very successful without ever being a public company. But 15 years ago, let's say 20 years ago, when I wrote the first real estate conference reality, 1997 approximately. So that's a little bit more, 23 years ago even. The top 10 companies in our industry were probably worth in the ballpark of 10, 15 billion. Today, if you take the top 10 companies in real estate that I like to look at and that I like to track, and I mean, I wrote, I wrote a list here quickly this morning, but if you just look at things, companies that are public or on the verge of going public, and I just jotted down some here, Zillow, EXP, Redfin, DocuSign, CoStar, Opendoor, Colnarchy, Compass, Black Knight, Kelly Williams. If you look at those kind of companies, my rough estimate is that those companies today are worth about 150 billion. So, so just on round numbers, we have in 20 years probably 10x our industry, 
10x our industry. If we just look at top 10 big companies, our industry is changing, guys. If trends was important 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it is even more important today. So, so please, please enjoy the time that you're going to have with Jack and Dean this morning. Their, their insights, uh, they, they helped me on the trends report. They helped me and Paul. They contributed in the, in the research. They've done a lot of prep for you today to try and bring you a, a synopsis and a summary of just a tad of what's in the report. The report is close to 200 pages, guys. If you're speed reading, it's going to take you a half a day. Remember, it took, it took some of us a thousand hours to put the deck together. Paul and I worked on this from around about August. So the fact that you're going to get today a 50-minute summary from these guys is just freaking awesome. Take lots of notes. Enjoy the call. Jack, I'm handing over to you and to Dean. I know you guys will do a fantastic job. Thank you for inviting me to open up the session today. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Stefan. We appreciate you so much and all the work that's gone into this report by yourself personally. Uh, I know that's, uh, that, that, that is uh, irreplaceable. And uh, you've provided the team with a tremendous amount of wisdom in guiding the research and the report. So again, I really appreciate you dropping by uh, and saying hello to everyone. And uh, if you're new to T360, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. And uh, we're going to go fast. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. If you've been on these before, we've been running uh, webinars about every month on broker topics. This just happens to be one of the biggest uh, topics that we cover, which is trends. Uh, and things that we see impacting uh, us for the next uh, several years. Uh, I will we'll quickly talk to you a little bit about how we determine what a trend is, how the organization thinks about trends. Um, we are, uh, we're an, an analysis, management consulting, research organization. So when we talk about trends, we are looking at things that we believe are impacting the industry now or are going to impact the industry over the next two to three years. So we're looking at things that we think belong on the executive agenda, uh, that deserve conversation and discussion uh, at the highest level in real estate companies and organizations uh, in this industry. Uh, so we're not a news organization. This isn't flash in the pan stuff. This isn't something just breaking news. This is really, we're looking at what are the big shifts that are happening uh, and how does it impact your business, whether you're running a brokerage, running an MLS, running a, a service provider that works with the industry. Uh, these, are, these are, we think, important things for you to learn about and consider. And if you are in brokerage or franchise, to provide leadership to your agents about what the what the changes in directions here. And I, I do also want to welcome my my uh, co-host, which is Dean Catrill here. Uh, Dean uh, joined us what three years ago now, Dean. Yeah. Thank you for coming up on. Yeah, and Dean has led our brokerage consulting practice. Uh, he's been the the principal consultant and lead, leader of that practice, and also the T three Fellows uh, de, uh, de broker and team development program. It's an executive program. We're going to talk about a little bit at the end. Uh, we're we're now in I think the tenth or eleventh class of that program. And Dean, you've done an awesome job leading that program. We have some really tremendous uh, uh, brokers and teams that have worked in that program and gotten great results. So, uh, so we're going to jump in, Dean. I know you've got some notes. I've, I've, I've got my, I've got my, my trends report with all my markups and things like that. So we're going to move fast and I'm going to flip on my screen here. So everybody can see, uh, see, uh, we, we have a few slides. Uh, like Stefan said, um, this is such a big report. Uh, I really, I wanted to put every page in the report into the slide deck. Uh, but obviously that has some logistical challenges and we would be here for you know many hours if we were to do that. So, uh, so we're gonna go at a high level uh, and move pretty quickly. And Dean and I will just pass it back and forth with our comments about each chapter and uh, a few of the takeaways that we think were, uh, were notable to us and that, that uh, may be important for you as well. Um, this doesn't replace reading this report. I still recommend you get a copy and you read it. If you've already gotten your copy, uh, you've got some time coming up over the holidays, uh, but it will give you some color and uh, a little bit of a, a fast track through it. So uh, this year we identified nine trends. There are nine trends that we believe are impacting and will continue to impact the industry. Um, usually we identify 10. We really try to get to 10. Uh, we normally start with as many as 14 or 15 different uh, things that we think are trends, and then we spend hours doing research. Uh, and we did that again this year. And we threw out some of our candidates because no, nah, we don't think that's quite at the level to deserve to go in the report yet. So we, we tossed those out. So we're going to be going quickly through all of these and we're going to start 
uh, in reverse order, uh, sort of uh, Johnny Carson style. Uh, we'll start with uh, trend number nine. So we'll dive right into this one. So, so trend nine, and uh, this is about housing affordability and some of the uh, things that we ha have observed in the statistics and the numbers regarding housing affordability. Uh, it's a really great chapter for educating yourself, your agents, your team about what is happening with affordability in, uh, in our industry. Uh, it is uh, a, a major issue uh, that we see in many markets throughout the United States. Um, most major metro markets have been significantly impacted by housing affordability. Dean, do you want to share, what, what do you take away from this chapter on affordability? Now I'm going to share a few key charts. Yeah, I, I, uh, it was... Um... You know, affordability, uh, medium home prices, we hit an all-time high in the medium home price as of August. It was mm. 310. Where new construction's been off. I love the statistics that were provided in the uh, in the chapter there. Uh, average 1.5 million homes built on average between 1980 and 2007, and that dropped to a million uh, from then on to 2013. It's been an increase, but nowhere close to the demand uh, that's needed for homing or for housing. So there's two pressures. We've got high prices. We've got not a lot of new inventory coming on. Um, and you got price tiers. I love the piece in the article, in the chapter on the trend about the price tiers and how the low tier, medium tier, and top tier, and how there's differentiations. Right here it is. Yeah, this is a great chart. So this one, uh, the upper third is white, middle third is the kind of maroon, and then the, the yellow is the lower third. And this shows in the different markets, the percentage growth over the last uh, uh, 11 years in pricing trends. You can see that yellow, that lower third tier. I mean, in Phoenix, it's up over 200% of where it was in 2009. In Miami, it's 150%. In Las Vegas, it's almost 170%. So it's, it's very, you can see that lower tier uh, really has come up so substantially, uh, which makes it that is the entry tier. That's the first time home buyer. Uh, that is the tier that powers what ha what comes next, which is people move into bigger houses uh, as they develop in their careers and grow their income. So I think that's a really great uh, chart. Um, this one, Dean, I, I pulled this one out because uh, I, I, I think the story that this one in the next slide tells, um, you know, our industry is really driven uh, by what people can afford on their median household income. And there, you know, the, 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 we are testing the limits of that historically. And here, this is zoomed in, over, you know, since 2001, since the last 20 years, you can see the run up prior to the, the, the big recession happening with home prices and, uh, and, you know, mortgages becoming very easy to get and uh, relatively inexpensive. And then you see the drop off, which happened after the recession. And we've kind of been in a slower, but definitely a run up. But I think the real, uh, the real one for me was looking, looking at the, how the affordability index has bounced around uh, in a little more granular detail where you see really what's happening here. You know, that historically levels of uh, affordability um, have, have been changing quite a bit and that we are in a cycle where things are becoming less and less affordable. So I think that's an important- uh, In the last slide that you showed up before this one, it was interesting that the, yeah, this one here, I think the suppression in 2017 and 19 has been the interest rates. And that's yeah. so the interest rates have gone to zero um, yeah. from the Fed. And so that's been something that's played into that curve coming down, but interest rates as we know are not gonna be there forever. They're gonna start tweaking yeah. up and it's gonna help. And it's gonna not help, it's gonna challenge this whole discussion in the in affordability. So this, uh, this chart, which is in the chapter, um, talks about the availability of, uh, of, of housing for people. What is the opportunity uh, for people to get involved with the housing industry? And you can see we're on a declining curve here. We're on something where over time, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more challenging for the average family to get involved with purchasing homes because of these pressures uh, that are happening. And I, I think the... Uh, you know, the, so, it, so this chapter's got a few, it's got a bunch of, uh, there are a lot more charts in here uh, that, that you can share with your agents or with your leadership. Um, let's talk about some reasons for this. I thought the, the sum up of the reasons, I think, Dean, you talked about lack of supply. Yeah. Um, the other one, this one um, was surprising to me, uh, labor shortages, and that has contributed to rising construction costs. So you go, well, why do we not have builders building more homes? 
And part of it is this labor shortage that we have and that we don't have enough people working in the available to work in the construction industry in such a way where builders are able to make uh, make the net profit or run the businesses they need to run. So that was was surprising to me. And the other one, um, land costs that goes with that uh, also is impacting the new home construction. Yeah, even uh, the cost of materials too, Jack. So yeah. even materials, the wood prices, everything's uh, yep. going higher. Land costs, materials, and then the, the final one we had in that section was about the local regulatory environment is that it's in some areas it's become more difficult to do uh, new construction or to build. Um, and I think you mentioned mortgage rates being uh, historically where they have been, I think has, has been this, has what's kept the market going is that it's so low. If I think if the mortgage rates came back up, uh, we would see a pretty dramatic slowdown uh, from that. Um, so those are just a few of the reasons. Um, this chapter has a lot more uh, in depth on the housing affordability crisis, but we do think this is something that uh, as uh, participants in residential real estate housing, um, we need to advocate for, we need to pay attention to, uh, and it will likely not go away. We think this one is here for the next several years uh, until we solve some of these fundamental uh, issues uh, with uh, inventory. So. Somebody came over on the chat said the brown and white asked the question about the brown and white, these uh, lines, the brown's just the beginning of the year, just yeah. indicating the first quarter, and then the white, yeah. uh, just to show differentiation between each of the years. Um, so that just came over in the chat. There's also a question that came over in the chat about units, and then the stat I gave was from 1980 to 2007, the average new construction was at 1.5 million units coming on each year. That mm -hmm. was the average. And that's all yeah. in the chapter. You'll see that in the trends report. Yeah. Yeah, good, good uh, reference for that in the chapter. That's one of the nice thing about having a report like this is you've got a, a clear source of reference for this information. We don't, you don't have to go look for it yourselves. Uh, it makes it much more authoritative. So uh, next trend we're going to talk about is the clear cooperation uh, policy, which um, I think, you know, m many of the brokers that we've talked to um, with the, about this policy, um, you know, have, have, implemented it over this last year. This was passed uh, by NAR a year ago. It was passed in 2019 and really governs the rules by which how uh, housing uh, is marketed in uh, an MLS jurisdiction to say if you are uh, if you are marketing a property, you need to put it in the MLS. Uh, you can't market it for weeks without uh, getting it into the MLS. So um, we interviewed a number of brokers about this policy and some of the challenges and struggles related to it and have documented many of those challenges to talk about where, where there have been differences. If you participate in multiple MLSs, there are oftentimes differences in how this policy has been implemented, which can make things challenging. So we've had many, especially of our larger brokers, um, have issues with their technology, with making sure that things that get put in, get uh, put in in a timely fashion, and then have followed the different rules that many of the MLSs have had. Uh, and, um, you know, se separately from that, um, also some of the challenges it's created for agents. And we, we had a great um, uh, uh, webinar earlier uh, on our Fireside Friday, where we had some agents talk about uh, some of the challenges in uh, their marketing, where they have often uh, taken to their sellers, we're going to do a pre-marketing or pre-market campaign for you. Uh, we're going to do things for you that are a little special, a little different. Uh, and many of those uh, marketing tools have been effectively taken away with this policy. It puts everybody on a level playing field. So Dean, I don't know, do you have any comments on this? I've got a couple yeah, I think It kind of started with the coming soon. It was uh, yeah. this started down that path where some networks on Facebook and others were putting listings. And then it was like, all right, let's get the coming soon. Give two weeks ahead of time. So if someone's looking in a market, they'll know it's coming soon. And then it just kept on running down that road. So I think that's part of probably the catalyst that brought this about. In this, I know there's a few outstanding pending lawsuits as well, going back and forth from some of the participants that involved brokerages uh, involved and things like that. So we'll see how this all plays out. Yeah, and there, there's some interesting um, elements here that tie into another chapter later, our chapter on the diversity trend. Um, you know, it, it is um, 
uh, it's not a stretch to think that uh, programs, marketing programs that are making listings harder for people to get to could create issues with diversity in housing, where, um, you know, if you have private marketing networks and things like that. And so the policy describes that, but I, I think it may be something that will be viewed in the future um, as a, a, a really good move to prevent, um, you know, uh, charges that there are uh, listings that are not being exposed to the public for discriminatory purposes. And yeah. so that, that's, that's why this one is, is here to yeah. say. That, that door opens up with, um, you know, the private networks and things like that. Um, so there's other scenarios that have happened in the past that kind of um, that brought about homes being sold on a private network, and then some of the seller finds out that they could have sold for more money, and then there's lawsuits that yeah. have happened from that. So, um, so I think uh, you know moving down this, we'll see again. We'll see, uh, wait and see how this all plays out. But I can see why the policy came about. Yeah, and then um, the last thing I'll say on it is we did uh, survey brokers about um, how did COVID impact their implementation, and um, you know some of our respondents did say that. Uh, that COVID did impact them. It caused the change. Most it did not. Most of them, they proceeded as they had normally planned. Uh, but because of COVID, for some people, it moved it up. It altered the way that they went after the implementation of the policy because of the COVID um, you know, pandemic. So um, next trend we're going to talk about is uh, the brokerage ancillary business playbook. And boy, does this sure look timely. I mean, we wrote this. Uh, we wrote this over the summer and uh, edited it in the fall. And when you see, a, a, you know, a former Zillow executive, Greg Schwartz, and uh, do a, a fundraising round, a seed round for forty was it forty million dollars on yeah. uh, on a kind of a, a mortgage type offer in into the industry. Um, you know, it, it certainly feels timely given that and a few and several other things like that, or there's some other companies that are making some moves here, but Dean, talk to us. I know this, this is a near and dear to your heart, this chapter and, and tell us a little bit about it. It's so, excuse me. It's so important, um, as a, as a brokerage is, uh, out there and the, if so fixated on real estate sales and with the diminishing, we had the, uh, uh, trend last year that we talked about the diminishing returns and challenges for running a brokerage. And in that, you have the suppression or compression of the commission. You have the uh, challenges with the agents, uh, uh, the commissions being paid out to the real estate agents for retention purposes, things like that. So you have compression on both sides of that, creating a real thin line. We benchmark return on revenue. Um, so when you benchmark return on revenue, it's just getting lower and lower. It's single digits, very low single digits. So the ability to generate additional revenue streams is so important. And it's becoming, you know, the big guys, the big brokerages have known this for a long time and they've moved into this space and they their own their own title entities. They have JV, JVs, their own mortgage companies. They do the warranty, the insurance, and they've been tapping out of that, tapping into this as a revenue stream for, for years. Uh, actually to the point, some of the largest organizations have their compensation structures for their managers where they're compensated on the capture percentages they receive in these areas. Uh, it's no longer, it used to be on the profitability. Now it's all about how much capture percentage are you getting on mortgage and title? Because that's where the majority of the revenue is being generated, bottom line profit to that organization. So nowadays it's actually moving. What's great about this trend and for everybody, whether you're small or midsize, the door is opening up with other opportunities for you to move into this as well. You were kind of before excluded just because of the size that there wasn't enough business, not enough revenue. That's changing. Yeah, you can get involved now. There are companies that have made it much easier to get involved in a joint venture in the ancillary business to get it up and off the ground. And they've already done a lot of the lifting for you. We're seeing national partnerships uh, in, with many franchise organizations uh, that allow uh, people to, to do that much more easily now. And I think, I think for me, this, this, uh, this playbook, you know, if, you're, if you are doing ancillary business, this is a good baseline to look and say, are we doing the best practices described in this chapter? If you're not, I think it's a really good primer for here are the different opportunities. Here's where to start. Uh, here's the ones that are gonna be most profitable for you soonest. Uh, here's where to go. Uh, I also think it does a nice job of answering. There's some questions on the consumer side, which I included a few slides of like, um, you know, who, who, who are 
um, you likely uh, going to consider the service providers your primary point of contact. Real estate agent is still the primary point of contact. Still, the this is why on the broker side this is important. Is your real estate agents are most likely contacting the consumers first. You know they're at the front line. They're they're handling the 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 I'm shopping for housing questions, and the likelihood that um, a a home buyer will use affiliated services. Uh, as you can see, has grown. Like we, we're seeing between 2010 and now, um, consumers appreciate will use the in-house uh, services, the affiliated services. Uh, and then, um, you know, lastly, just the awareness of one-stop shopping of like, hey, I want to go to one, have one agent, and then I want them to guide me through the process, including all of the uh, affiliated services and vendors uh, and the positive impact. So, uh, the consumer data here is is very strong. Um, so not only is it easier to do, uh, the consumers are more ready for it. I think this industry has been talking about one-stop shopping for a long time. That's not a new concept. But what makes it a trend is the consumer appears to be um, really ready for it, desires it, values it. And we have uh, companies that are making it easier to implement your affiliated services uh, business. So, uh, so we think this is a strong, important read, especially for, you know, those of you that are operating brokerages or if you're in franchise and do not have some of these um, easy on-ramps to affiliated uh, business services for your, uh, for your franchisees. So um, next we're going to jump to is we're going to talk about franchising. So the real estate franchising landscape. Um, so this is a, this is a fun chapter. We, um, this is like classic T360 research sort of thing where Stefan uh, asked us one day, he said, you know, um, I think it'd be really great if we understood what's going on with what franchises are charging and what their fees are and what their offer is. And, you know, who are all the fran like, let's go a layer deeper. And as, as many of you know, in our annual publication, uh, which I got a copy of here, the Real Estate Almanac, um, we do list uh, the top franchises in the industry. If you go to realestatealmanac.com, there's a digital version. You can find all of them. But what's not in the Almanac is, you know, what is it like to be a franchisee? How would I consider different franchises? Um, if you are a franchisor, how do you have some basic competitive information? And so uh, that's kind of where this one started. We said, you know, and I, I think people have said to us many times, oh, well, franchising is dead. And the statistics speak contrary to that. They actually say that the franchising industry is doing quite well right now. So what we've done in this chapter is um, written a, 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 some analysis of the different franchises, um, looked at some of the, you know, the top, I mean, if you look at this, you say, well, 10% of home sales in the U.S. are going through, you know, one brand, which is Keller Williams Realty. That's, that's pretty astonishing. You know, that's, that's a big, that's a big number, right? And so the franchises still do an enormous amount of business. And, and as a matter of fact, the case is that they're doing more than they were before. Um, so, so that's just some kind of fundamentals. Now, some of that came out of the Real Estate Almanac research. But then the, the thing we did that was, I think, just really fun was we went through and we, and I don't know if you guys can see this, but we went through and we cataloged in a huge table, uh, which again, wouldn't show up well on a, on, a, on a slide deck like this, but catalog what the um, upfront fees, ongoing fees, marketing fees, other fees, um, how long their typical franchise contracts are, just all of this information about, um, you know, the, the, the national franchises. I do want to make one call out, which is uh, JP and Associates, uh, we missed them. They were in the original, some of the original documentation and they got cut during editing. So accidentally it was a mistake, but as far as I'm aware, they're the only uh, franchise of substance that was not included in the report. And we'll be providing some information about them separately from the print report, which is, we obviously can't reprint it because we missed somebody, but I wanted to give a call out to them to say, we, we saw it when we got, I saw it when I got the report on a Sunday and said, oh my goodness, I think we've missed somebody. So, um, yeah, so JP on that. Um, yeah, no, I talked to him yesterday and I said, hey, I'm, you know, we, we, we're very sorry. Sometimes things happen in, in editing or in, you know, it, it's, we're not perfect. Uh, we work really hard, but we're not perfect. Uh, any yeah. comments on the franchise? Yeah, I, I love this chapter for all the reasons you've just stated. It's just laid out beautifully. And one of the things also that's interesting when we talk about, when we talk with our clients and the brokerage industry out there and even large teams that are kind of deciding what they want to do as they, if they move into brokerage or where they go independent, do they buy a franchise or do they move into a franchise? 
Um, I, another statistic kind of ties into this slide you have here is in 2019, 20 of the largest franchise brands did 1.4 trillion or 44% of the total existing home sales that year. So it was almost half in the top 20 of the France. So it's a large number. That's say there's a ton of independent brokerages out there as well. And the way we describe it and, and do well, it's a tool. It's another tool in the toolbox to yeah. think about depending on you know uh, price. It's, it's a really kind of a comparison on the investment of money and, and, and what you get from that. And people have to weigh it to decide whether they want to move into that direction or not. Yeah, it's, it's funny, Dean. I think a lot of people, if they come to us, they're like, we want you, you want T360 to pick a side. Are you with the independents? Are you with the franchises? And we're like, we're with the industry. We're not picking a side. We're just here to report what's going on. And what's right. going on is 40% of the business is being done by franchise organizations, which is just, that's just the facts. And all of these business models have relevance. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. Like they're, they obviously have something that works and the, for their customers, for their franchisees. So it's not, we're, we're not here to, we're not here to declare winners and losers. We're just saying this is what's yeah. going on. And, you know, we've, we've consulted with brokers that have said, hey, I, I decided to go independent. And for them, it's been the right move. And we've consulted with other brokers that said, you know what, I think I need what this franchise will supply me in order to hit my next level of growth. And I love what you just said about, it's just a tool. It's just yeah. a tool. So this is not a dogmatic uh, discussion for us. It's very, it's very pragmatic in terms of its use. Um, I do want to point out, I didn't put a slide in on this, but we have a, some beautiful excerpts from uh, uh, the Real Estate Almanac in here as well and some new graphics. That's the technology landscape, um, which we have a, a product, which I'll probably briefly show you guys at the end of this. Um, but we have some just some beautiful uh, uh, two-page layouts in here um, that are, add some value to this report. I just flipped by that one. Well. Yeah, make sure, Chris, you put the uh, Real Estate Almanac link in there for everybody. They should definitely go see the Real yeah, Estate there's, Almanac. Yeah, there's some great uh, material there if you're exploring the industry and, and this uh, franchise section um, just really goes deep on the, the franchise or the industry. Um, the next chapter is, uh, trend is about, uh, you know, EXP, uh, which is a national brokerage uh, really a company that is, you know, just barely over 10 years old. And um, it, it's like anything, they're an, over, they're an overnight sensation. It just took them, you know, a little bit more than a decade to become an overnight sensation. And uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the speed of their growth and, uh, you know, all of the things that they've done, they, they really established themselves uh, as one of the top brokerages uh, in, in, the, in the United States. And uh, now they're moving into Canada and a few other markets. Uh, but we, we did a whole deep dive on EXP, uh, what's behind them, how do they work, um, you know, what, what do you need to know? So, Dean, any comments on this? I've got a few slides on here. Yeah, okay, I, I found this, I have a full page of notes here, um, and it was just amazing, the, the deep dive. I, I think there's, it, it takes me back to the 1990s when I was sitting in the boardroom with Wes Foster when I was at Long & Foster, and we're talking about Keller, Keller Williams and KW and the expansion and the growth, and it was exponential. And now seeing what and seeing the growth, and I think you're going to show a chart here of how that growth has taken place with EXP yeah. over the last several years. This right here, that 20 times over the last what four years or so, it's really incredible uh, what they've done. And like anything, when you see that type of growth, you know, agents vote with their feet, right? So if biggest that we're trying to recruit to brokerages, um, you know, it's the proof and success leaves clues. So they're doing something right. They're attracting agents. Uh, to this organization. And so understanding, having some clarity of what they're doing is extremely beneficial to you running your operation as well. And th this really, this chapter, this trend gives you a deep dive on exactly the background and to the present day of what they're doing in their, in this operation, which I found was fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, any, anytime somebody's grown like that, they are doing something right. And it's yep. time to look at it. We had a, we had a question come in to say where you know where is EXP on the brokerages list, and it's number one. The franchise it's, list. It's, all right. Well, they're they're not a franchise. They're a brokerage, so they're on on brokerage list. But they're number four on the brokerage yeah. list. Uh, so that's ranked. You see, in sales well, volume, national rank. Our franchise. That's our, because our question was, you know, what? Why aren't they on the franchise list? And they're yeah, not yeah. a franchise. They're not a franchise. Yeah, they don't they don't sell franchises. They are one big national brokerage. Um, similar to uh, Realogy Brokerage Group, which is formerly NRT, similar to Compass, which is a national brokerage, similar to Redfin, which is a national brokerage, but they're ranked number four, and they have climbed those charts very rapidly coming into the top 10, I think, 
Yeah. I think it came into the top 10 two years ago and, yeah. uh, and have moved into the number four position. So Yeah, they're number uh, three in units and, and uh, an agent count. So they're number three in units and agent count, number four in sales volume. Yeah, and, and they've had some uh, pretty exciting results as a publicly traded company. Um, you know, they, they have, they're now at a $3.5 billion market cap as of October. Obviously, things move around every day. Uh, and you can go check their ticker right now if you want to. But just to give you a, a sense of uh, the, the, the lay of the land, they've become a very large publicly traded company in our space. Um, and, and all of that's happened. I mean, the, the big growth has really happened in the last three to four years. Uh, but it was a, a slow burn to get to where uh, that is happening. So I think this is a, a you know chapter talks about their use of their virtual environment, uh, their revenue sharing program, um, their way of bringing in uh, their equity program for uh, rewarding people with equity and ownership in the company. Yeah. Uh, so these are some these are some plays that I think you're seeing other uh, you know emerging uh, brokers and uh, other businesses use like Fathom. Uh, who just recently went public. And, you know, because we've got one that's done it very successfully, uh, there will be more. There will, we anticipate more uh, publicly traded, uh, you know, national brokerage type companies or franchise type companies. If they can see their way to, to making it work like EXP does, uh, why wouldn't we have more of that? And I think it, it puts some pressure on um, the industry to figure out how can we reward people that are engaged with us in some kind of profit or revenue share or ownership or something like that. I think it, it, it really opens that door um, to that the, broader concept. Yeah. And in the broadcast, and it all, it's all laid out in the chapter. It's actually beautiful in this trend, but they're the really interesting tack too, is they have some vesting. They actually give stock uh, as you shared uh, as, as part of like your first stock um, first closing it's on page 106, an equity sharing program. A point, a cap, you get $400. And so there's certain dollar amounts they get in stock and they vest over a three-year timeline. And the vesting approach, that's what typically the organizations do with employees. And so they have this, they've worked this through where they actually have, you know, in agents, you know, the idea of having, being ownership of something bigger than themselves or their own business, getting some of that residual or some of that passive income is really something of a draw. It's proven to be a huge draw. Yeah, a great. And, and it's, you'll, you'll notice they're not the only one that is using that. Uh, so, so, so I, I do think that concept is here to stay. Um, it's been proven to work in other industries where people work really, really hard and make lots of money like technology industry and startup industries. Um, the concept of you have a piece of the company or you, you have, there, there's some value to you being there beyond just the transaction you did yesterday. So I, I think that concept is here to stay. Um, we did have a question about has the pandemic uh, helped EXP? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that we tried to address that in the chapter, um, but I would say that uh, in, you know, anecdotally in conversations, the fact that they already had a, a mature virtual online environment set up for training and support. Um, they, I think they were positioned well for that, but I will also give a lot of credit to this whole industry. We've got it in one of the chapters we're gonna talk about. Uh, this industry really moved online within six weeks if they weren't there already. I mean, we, we, we as an industry got cracking. We figured out Zoom, we figured out Slack or whatever chat thing we're doing or Microsoft Teams or whatever it was. We got that figured out pretty fast. But I do think EXP uh, probably had a significant head start because they've already got a culture where they were used to meeting online, used to doing education in a virtual environment, um, used, used to getting support in that way versus necessarily um, going into a physical office. So I think they probably had a head start, but um, this industry uh, uh, rapidly pivoted uh, and, and it's been impressive. So I, um, so yeah, so that that's that piece there. Um, so we'll move on to um, trend four which is uh, revitalizing real estate's largest franchise or in brokerage company. So I think there is a case to be made. We have some copy in the chapter about this, that, you know, Realogy as a company uh, really represents in many ways, the traditional industry uh, because of the collection of brands it has and the business models they operate that it's, it's as a, you know, as a, uh, 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 the largest uh, uh, collection of these kinds of companies together, um, it, it, it looks most like the traditional industry just because of its composition. Um, Dean, I know you, you were with Realogy for a, a significant portion of your career. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts from this chapter. What did you take away from it? 
Yeah, I thought the, the deep dive on getting, I, I thought it was great. And the, um, the change from NRT to the RBG uh, brokerage group, Realty brokerage group, and seeing the, the actual financials and the numbers and the, was very insightful. Um, the, most of the revenue is coming in through that company-owned stores. Uh, the tact and the, the strategy was from Realogy, it is Realogy, uh, was in the major, major market areas. Uh, they're going to have owned operations, mostly Caldwell Banker, uh, which, and then there'll be some Sotheby's and there's some Cork in the Corcoran and, and group in, in New York City. But then in those 27 largest metro markets and then outside, and their average price at NRT, for example, is in the 500s, 522,000, which was in the trend report as well, chapter. And then the average price, as we know, in the market in general is 308 at the time, 308,000. So, so outside of those general markets, that's where the Realogy's plan was, let's sell franchises. And so lower price points, less homes that sell franchises. We'll do the franchise network, um, which is a Realogy franchise group. In larger markets, metropolitan markets, we're going to own the operations. They're going to be a part of the Realogy brokerage group. And then they have the title arm as well and all the numbers. So I thought it was great, really well laid out. I thought it was also very interesting to see kind of the, the suppression of the IPIDA number. So the earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization. So there's been pressure on that. And that showed from 2012, it went from 4.76 down to 2019 to 0.09. Yeah, so it doesn't make any sense. Really being compressed. Um, now that's after royalties and for, for company owned stores, the royal, royalty is going to the company. So there is there is some money in there, but looking at the IPIDA number by itself, that is a very thin margin. And that's why it's very important for this operation, this organization to have all those different ancillary services as they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I we we have, I pulled in some of the stats and facts that I thought were 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 interesting about the company. That I mean, you're looking at a, at a company that has the third uh, largest uh, by sales volume, the fifth, the sixth, the tenth, the eleventh, the fifteenth. I mean, that's that's extraordinary to have yeah. all of those within a single stable. So very very uh, interesting to see that. And then some of the sales numbers you talked about in terms of the 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 you know the the ranking. Uh, uh, and, and the average size of the transactions, and you know, you're, so so just to see the volume that's happening within this, uh, and the and how they compare versus other uh, companies uh, nationally. So yeah. uh, I like the way they're that. pivoting too. They're pivoting with reorganization. They've reorganized, reorganized with uh, NRT now with our RBG um, and having. You know, Ryan Gorman, for example, instead of overseeing just the company owned stores, now he oversees all of Caldwell Banker, the franchise and others. And there's been other changes they've made to reorganize. They've created new partnerships uh, that are outlined in the trends chapter with Amazon, AARP, things like that. So they're, they're, they're staying up with, uh, with new programs. Here you go. Yeah, I thought I thought they're they're uh, the, the you know, tech and services that they're offering. Um, they've added several new things. I had the highlights here. Um, moving into the iBuyer space with Realsure, which is their iBuyer uh, offer. I mean, I think that's a that's a big change for them. Uh, adding a listing concierge service, uh, a social media ad engine. We've been talking to brokers that we work with about how you know social media and specifically Facebook. Um, they're not going to replace the listing flyer, but boy, they're maybe more important than the listing flyer to get out in front of your uh, your audience, your consumers, your people you're connected to. Super important. They've rolled out some pretty significant um, initiatives. Real vitalized their uh, uh, their program to um, help with upgrades and uh, and revitalizing homes in order to put them on the market. So just uh, they're they're working over there. And I think a ship this big it takes time to turn. Uh, yep. It really does. And and I think they've taken a beating in the public markets for that fact that it's so big. It's just you know it takes a while for them to do. And they they did have some challenges with some of their earlier initiatives uh, in technology. So um, well, that's, a, I was there for a decade, as you said, I was there for 10 years and a lot of smart, really smart people over there. And they see trends like the revitalize you just mentioned there. there. That's something that came out. It was some, some competitors in the market kind of went out with some interesting programs. Uh, and, you know, here these guys move pretty quick to put something in place and put it out at scale, which is pretty powerful. That's how quick they're able to, you know, once they see something, uh, they're able to put something in place and get it out in, in scale to a big audience. And what also came out in the chapter, which I thought was interesting, is it used to, when I was there, it used to be like NRT, now uh, 
you know, Realty Brokerage Group got everything. We had all the toys, we used to kind of say. And then the franchises would have to buy the toys. You'd get so much yeah. in a package and then you'd have, and yeah. then part of it you'd have to add more. So now they're actually part of, uh, it sounds like Ryan Schneider's point, perspective is, let's give a lot of the toys to all the players, to all the uh, franchisees and to the company owned mm -hmm. stores. So it mm -hmm. seems like yeah. more in that direction. And that, that is a big change to say, we're really gonna make this more of a platform for everybody, yeah. not just for the company owned stores. So. Okay, well, let's move on to trend three. We're going to keep this on, on schedule. Um, we've got about 16 minutes left. Um, so we did a whole chapter on uh, diversity and inclusion in the industry. Um, you know, obviously, this has been a major conversation in 2020. I think people's awareness uh, about it has gone up. Um, I think the chapter has some great statistics to help uh, educate and understand the issues uh, related to home ownership and diversity, you know, there, there's no way to uh, look at it any other way where you say, um, if, you know, if you are white, you are much more likely to own a home, uh, much more likely to have, have a home. If you are any other race, it's just, you have some, there's some differences. There's some challenges there because of socio socioeconomics, because of lending practices, because of historical nature of home ownership because of lack of awareness of, um, you know, building equity or uh, moving into home ownership in some communities. And so um, I think we do a good job in this chapter of outlining some of the challenges with redlining, access to credit, um, steering, um, you know, very topical with some of the things that we saw happen in Long Island with the study that was done by Newsday last year. Um, I think also uh, good for the industry to look at and acknowledge, like if you were working uh, with principally white families, they have more, uh, they have more capital, they have a higher net worth. And that, that is that is a big challenge for, uh, for blacks or Hispanics or uh, anybody else moving into real estate is and, and it's, it's, a, it's a chicken of the egg thing. They, uh, they don't have they may not have the capital to, to get started. So that's why, as a, you know, as an industry um, advocating for programs to help with Home ownership to create that letter. I, I love something that uh, a speaker one time said. It says, you know, we, we want everybody to, you know, to, to climb the ladder, but there's got to be a ladder, right? It's important that there's a ladder. And so I think this um, really, you know, puts, a, puts some light on that, gives you some stats and facts. Um, we're actually doing some local um, diversity consulting work, Dean, and we're seeing, we're doing studies within local markets to look at this and, and this was done at the national level you dive into markets you find the specifics of here's why there are home ownership challenges uh in different markets nationally and uh, understanding those challenges we think is very powerful uh to to know and to be able to address locally um and then the last uh, yeah go ahead dean hop on it knowledge is power too so one of the things too that came in on our uh, Friday fireside chats. Um, we, I remember there was a section where you and Stefan had a couple of the different associations that represent yeah. um, some of these groups that you're mentioning here. Yeah. And it was great. And what, one of the conversation in, in my mind went, to, what opportunity? There's a tremendous opportunity uh, to a brokers, for example, if you have whatever percent of the uh, 20, uh, whatever the last slide was, percentages of that specific race that are purchasers, you know, there is a difference between that and the white, as you mentioned. And it's quite drastic difference as a percentage. Yeah. There's opportunity there, um, potentially. And as we know, as a wealth strategy, owning homes is a very good wealth strategy. It's really the uh, foundational wealth strategy for a lot of families across the country. And so there's a lot of opportunity there and knowledge is power. So I love the trends. I love this chapter. Loved seeing the statistics and information in it because it was very, it just turned on light bulbs for me. How it, it is. And I think you're absolutely right. And AREB, um, which is the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, which is the, the, uh, the association primarily with, um, to, for black members, although anybody can join, you don't have to be black to be a member of NAREB. Um, they said they, they had, I think it was a uh, hundred, there were hundreds of thousands of buyers that made six figures that were, uh, at, you know, they were black, but uh, they're out there waiting to be worked with. And I think that's why this slide is so important is that we don't actually don't have the professionals in our industry necessarily from those communities that maybe we should demographically. And we've, we've uh, it's, it's mentioned in the, in the trends report, uh, we've started a national nonprofit. We're doing some uh, work to stand it up for next year called the Real Estate Apprentice Foundation to help address that issue uh, in the small way that we can. It's too big for any one company to address 
but we're, we were intending to, to do some work on that. Um, there are some other good uh, charts in here showing historical trends in this. So uh, I, I encourage you to, this is a great area to be really well educated on and understand it. We've also included the initiatives we're aware of at many of the major companies in the industry. So good stuff there. Um, trend two, we're gonna move through this one pretty quick because we're getting about 11 minutes left. Um, so this, this chapter um, is, wrote. yeah. <laughs> This is a fun one. So this one, um, this one is about, you know, we, we talked about affiliated businesses earlier as a mechanism whereby brokers have been using to uh, improve their return on revenue and their profitability uh, as, as, you know, as business owners. Um, this is another one that's got some real meat and potatoes about, uh, we went out, we talked to a number of companies that are successfully doing, um, you know, company lead generation type of work, or they've built their team concept into their company. We even talked, we talked to a number of companies we didn't actually publish in this report. That's the other thing I'll tell you. Um, we interviewed broadly. There were two that stepped up and said, yes, you can use me as a case study report. We had several others that said, ah, this is, this is our secret sauce. We don't ever want everybody to know. So there's some very good statistics and details in here about how to run uh, a lead generation focused business in, in brokerage and some of the best practices and things you uh, really need to do to make it effective. And the results are compelling. You know, Dean, I know you and I uh, do a lot of benchmarking of these yeah. businesses and traditional brokerage. You know, traditional brokerages, it's usually a sub 10% uh, profitability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some of the, the models that we look at in this have come through our desk over the last two, three years. You know, we're seeing 25% profitability up to in the mid thir mid to upper 30s even. With some yeah, of the, the benchmarks are powerful. I think, you know, it success leaves clues, as we've said before, and when you look at these lead generation models, organizations that we work with that are out there in the industry, for example, whether it's an e-team or a brokerage, like Jack just said, the company dollar percentage. So the gross revenue comes in, the GCI, gross commission income, you pay the agents, and then whatever's left is that company dollar or, or closed or gross profit there. In that level, that percentage for team-based systems, it's in the 60s. It's like 60 plus percent, which is huge because the normal brokerage out there in the benchmark that we say is they were from 17 to 25 in that range. So much lower for the brokerage. So the team model is much higher because it's generating leads, it's supporting agents, right. it's able to gather more revenue, like Jack said. And then the bottom line, ROR, what goes to profit at the end? Typically, as we do benchmarks, it's very single digit, you know, very low single digits, as I mentioned Realty earlier. And the team based, they're mid 30s. Their, their return on revenue is just drastic. It's yeah, it's phenomenal. Because they're taking the risk on the front end, which means yep. they get the, you get the reward. You get the reward. And this is one, you know, it's not one where we tell people, hey, go run out and start generating leads for your agents and everything will be just fine. I mean, we did that experiment for a decade. There's now a lot of best practices and there's some people who have done it very successfully. And, you know, a lot of times it really comes down to good, solid management and execution. This is an execution trick. It's yep. not an idea trick it's an execution piece and having people really focused on their particular roles and what they do uh, having strong leaders and managers in order to run this kind of a model super important it's a numbers model uh, and you have to be very tightly tied into what's happening how much you're spending how many leads are coming in what's closing that kind of thing and managing that and having specialization helps you hold people accountable and make that happen so uh, so I'm going to move us right along. Uh, trend one, real estate in post-pandemic. Um, this, uh, this is a great chapter. I mean, if we were all going to holiday parties, there's some stuff in this chapter that is just interesting, period. It doesn't matter if you're in the real estate industry or not. Um, like we've got some great statistics on, you know, which industries were impacted by COVID. And, at, you know, as we mentioned earlier, um, you know, real estate tracks employment. This is uh, people aren't employed, they don't buy houses. Uh, and this tells you where, where the impact was the deepest. Um, we've got some, we didn't include, uh, this, this has a ton of graphs and charts. And, and, you know, I've got this nice one that shows the, the change in employment during that there's the big dip that we saw and then the recovery of that dip and how the bottom quartile is of course the slowest to recover, but some really great uh, charts and stats there. And then some specific deep dives where we did with companies and said, let's talk, talk to us about, the changes during the months, the early months of this pandemic uh, from March through June. And what did that look like and what sorts of changes? So, so I'm not going to try to go through this chart with you, but it's just to say there's some really fantastic um, charting of that activity, uh, as well as looking at how, how is the recovery gone? You know, where, where, how far did we dip? And then how have we come back up as an industry? So 
Um, again, this is um, some, some, some knowledge that not only is interesting or useful in real estate practice, understanding how we handle a, a shock like COVID. Uh, so for your own planning purposes, like if, this, if things were gonna happen like this again, what would it look like and what sort of reserves would you need to maintain? Um, but also just for general market knowledge and understanding the industry and how we fit in and how it fits in with employment. So uh, any, any thoughts on the, the COVID chapter? Yeah, just real quick, um, the absorption rate uh, graph that's in there in the, in the trend chapter as well is fantastic. You know, there was a, a 3% in February. It went up to as high as 5.8 in May and then dropped back down to three. So it is definitely still a seller's area. And this should, frankly, sc scared everybody. If you're running a brokerage and you just went through that first three, four, five, six weeks, if uh, the brokers is what we work with, the companies we work with, their secondary markets, they were in a longer lull. It was more like a six to eight week time. Typically in a more residential area, it was more of a, what, a three, four week. And then we came back out of it. People started lifting their head up start buying houses again, things like that. So it should have scared you. Get ready, um, prepare, have cash reserves, like Jack said, make sure you have at least six months. Those are the things that we recommend, if not more, so you can take full opportunity of a down market. The, the funny bit for me, Dean, is I remember we were planning our broker retreats for the spring, and we were going to do what we refer to as a crash test, yeah. where we were going to take the break. We've done, we did this two years ago, where we said, okay, bring in your financials, you know, we're going to take a uh, take a 30 percent decline in your financials. Tell us what you're going to do. And, and right. it's a live it's a live fire exercise. We have them come up with their what's their plan for handling a 30 or 40 percent decline in revenue. And we didn't have to do that because the market did it for us. Yeah. And so and I will say, our I think our, the brokers we're working with handled it wonderfully. We talked to a lot of national brokers. I think people really uh, buckled down and did right. They learned a lot from the last recession. I think everybody had their raincoat and their hat, oh, yeah. their, their umbrella, and they were ready. They were ready for it to be uh, to be what it was going to be. Yeah, so, they're coming out of this being more profitable than they were last time. So they're very yeah, thankful. That, yeah, many of our brokers are having the most incredible. And I know if you're a broker right here, you probably had a good year. You know, most brokers we talked to had a very good year. Some had the best year they've had ever. So, um, so good for you guys. So, guys, we got like three and a half minutes left. Uh, I'm going to wrap us up with a few things that we just want you to be aware of. That's our overview of the trends. I'm going to talk about a few other zero items. First of all, if you have not gotten your trends report. Um, you can still order it uh, through tomorrow at our pre-order pricing. Uh, it's all on at t3trends.com. You can pick it up. It's still got pre-order pricing, so you still have special pricing. But that ends tomorrow. We move into regular pricing now that the book has been published and out and shipped. And we're shipping because of COVID. We're shipping. We're trying to ship as quickly as we can, but we're restricted to going into our offices to do shipping. So we'll probably ship once or twice a week. So uh, if you were now, you'd probably get it uh, sometime mid to late next week. But wait, there is more. Uh, there is more. And I want to share that with you. Um, we have a brand new uh, service. We have several, but this is one that's brand new, super cool, uh, called T3 Intel. When you order your trends report in it, there will be a little postcard like this. It's got Stefan and I on it, and there's a little tablet and computer in the background. On the back of that, there is there will be a, a special code for T3 Intel. What T3 Intel is, one of our biggest requests we've had is, can I access this digitally? Can I get cop can I get this in a PDF? Da, 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 da. Well, we've done that. We've not only done that uh, for this trans report, we've done it for all of the trans reports. And so if you go online, I'm going to just hop online right now. So this is T3 Intel. It's a uh, database intelligence platform. So you can come in here and you can do a search and find out where has T360 written about anything that's in our archive. So you can find out, hey, where, you know, when do we write about high buyers? And here's all the chapters for that. If you're a company, you can say, you know, uh, where, where is Howard Hanna mentioned in the reports that we have issued? And you'll see not only our regular reports, but also any of the reports in which you were ranked as a company or you individually as a leader. So super powerful service. Uh, this card has that trial code on it. You're going to get a 90 day free trial to the service. If you want to sign up right now, it's $395 and you get full access to the entire library of trench reports, uh, all of our real estate almanac, SB 200 rankings, everything we've done. They're searchable, indexed, and archivable. Uh, I've already had companies that are reaching out to me and they ask things like, Hey, how many, you know, I'm doing a press kit. I want to know how many times we won awards from you guys or were recognized. And it's like, you can go in here and you just dial it up and you can see it. 
I also wanted to uh, let you guys know, we just launched a new website. So if you wanna know one of the things we have a challenge with, we're moving so fast, people don't know all the things we do. You can go here, there's a beautiful new website, a lot of information about our services. Um, they're there, including uh, the T3 Fellows program, which if you are not familiar with T3 Fellows, uh, you should definitely check it out. If you go under consulting, you can find deans right here and you can go learn more about T3 Fellows, which is our, uh, we run it twice a year. I think we're what in the 11th class. Yeah, 11th class starts in March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had almost a hundred brokers go through this program, very successful program for brokers. So uh, again, uh, new website, um, new T3 Intel service, uh, T3 Fellows program. I think we've got a new program kicking off in March. Now's a great time to reach out to us if you're considering getting involved with our group. Uh, and last thing I will tease, we have one more thing coming, which is uh, next month we'll be launching the T3 Tech Marketplace, which is a compre comprehensive index of all the technology companies in the industry organized into categories of functionality. Uh, you'll be able to go and look at companies and learn about all the things that they have to offer. Um, so you can go and find out what tools they have, uh, what information you can find out about them that we've collected and verified. A uh, really slick uh, new tool for everybody that's a fan of T360. We're just trying to organize the universe for you guys to make your jobs and lives easier and better. So uh, once again, if you uh, T3 Fellows is coming up, if you're interested, if you're a broker on this and you've heard about it before, you haven't heard about it, uh, go here, fill out an application, get in touch with Dean. We'd love to talk to you. And for, for everyone, uh, do go ahead and pick up your copy of the trends report at T3Trends.com if you have not already. Uh, special pricing now until tomorrow. Dean, I had like four or five things to try to get everybody yeah, on board with. Did I pull it off? You did, you did good. <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot Thanks of stuff. Thanks for showing up. We appreciate, we value your time. Um, if you're interested, the fellows program is a 12 month journey that we go down together. It's foundational where we start off, we take a deep dive, we audit your business, give you benchmarks, best practices. And then they literally walk you through the process that we recommend all brokers go through to improve your business, whether you're a new broker, small, medium, or very large brokers. We have all of them that work with us. Even large team leaders come into us and work with us through that process. So reach out if you have any questions or we can be of any help. Thanks, Jack. Great. Great job. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you on next month's uh, webinar and uh, look forward to it then and get, you know, get cracking on that trend support. There's a lot in there. Hope this was good for everyone and talk to you soon. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Absolutely. See everyone. <laughs> Bye now. See ya.